Hey everybody, welcome back to A Week in Geekdom. Gio here, and today I am finally reading Mermaid Saga from Rumiko Takahashi. This is actually my first time reading anything from the famous mangaka. I've only known her work through her various anime adaptations, so this is really awesome that I finally get to read something uh, from one of uh, the famous creators of manga. I'm really excited about that, and I chose as my first video, of course, Mermaid Saga. This is basically written in the mid-80s, if I remember correctly. It's a 16-chapter-long uh, creature horror anthology series where you follow characters that are after mermaid flesh. In folklore, it's said that if you consume the mermaid flesh, you will either be cursed for eternity as this half-monster-type creature thing, or uh, gain immortality or longevity. But before we can get onto the review of Mermaid Saga, we gotta go back. We're gonna go hunting for mermaids. Yes, let's do it. No, um, actually I'm being told that we're not doing on-field research for this one. So, on to the next scene. The Ningyo is a fish-like creature from Japanese folklore. Anciently, it was described with a monkey's mouth with small teeth like a fish, shining golden scales, and a quiet voice like a skylark or a flute. Its flesh is pleasant tasting and anyone who eats it will attain remarkable longevity. However, catching one was believed to bring storms and misfortunes, so fishermen who caught these creatures were said to throw them back into the sea. Typically, a ningyo that would wash onto a beach was usually seen as an omen of war or calamity. But aside from that monkey description from long ago, they are very different from the mermaids of Western tradition. Ningyo more closely resemble fish than humans, with a varying level of human-like features, ranging from just an ugly, deformed, fish-like face to an entire human torso with long, bony fingers and sharp claws. They can range in size from that of a human child to the size of a large seal. And unlike the mermaids of Atlantic and Mediterranean legends, Ningyo from the Pacific and the Sea of Japan are hideous to behold, resembling more of an otherworldly nightmare than that of a seductive siren. Ningyo sightings go back to the earliest written histories of Japan. The first recorded mermaid sightings are found in the Nihon Shoki, one of the oldest books of classic Japanese history, dating back to the year 619 Common Era. The flesh of a ningyo is believed to grant eternal life and youth to those who eat it, and thus it is the subject of many folktales. One of the most famous stories concerning the ningyo is called the Yao Bikuni, or Hafiaku Bikuni. The story tells how a fisherman who lived in the Wakasa province once caught an unusual fish. In all his years fishing, he had never seen anything like it, so he invited his friends over to sample its meat. One of the guests, however, peeked into the kitchen and noticed that the head of the fish had a very human-looking face and warned the others to not eat it. So when the fisherman finished cooking and offered his guests the ningyo's grilled flesh, they secretly wrapped it in paper and hid it so they could discard it on their way home. But one man, drunk on sake, forgot to throw the strange fish away. This man had a little daughter who demanded a present when her father arrived home. Carelessly, he gave her the fish and coming to his senses, he tried to stop her from eating it, fearing she would be poisoned. But he was too late, and the girl had already swallowed it whole. But as nothing particularly bad seemed to happen to the girl afterwards, the man did not worry about it for long. Years passed, and the girl grew and married. But after that, she did not age anymore. She kept the same youthful appearance while her husband grew old and died. After many years of perpetual youth and being widowed again and again, the woman became a nun and wandered through various countries. Finally, she returned to her hometown in Wakasa, where she ended her life at an age of 800 years. So with that out of the way, you sort of have a, you sort of have context about folklore and all that fun stuff. We go into Mermaid Saga, this a uh, horrific anthology series from Rumiko Takahashi. You have the main character of Yuta as he is seeking a way to end his 
longevity, his long life. He has been around for 500 plus years and uh, you know there's uh it's called life because there's a beginning and an end and we see the value of life through its ending and its meaning if not it's just a aimless collection of memories walking around right and if you're the only one that's immortal and everybody's passing away it can get i would assume it can get pretty boring and anxious as time goes on so the character of Utah uh, has had enough of this, what he considers it a curse. And that's one of the funny things about the series is that you have these different short stories about these characters seeking a way to prolong their life, seeking immortality, where the main character already has it and can attest that it's not as great as it seems and he seeks a way to end it uh, compared to the other people that for various reasons they uh, have gone through great lengths to search for the elusive mermaid flesh and all that stuff whether there are tales set in the past or the present in the case of the book in the mid 80s all these characters uh will do whatever it takes whether it's uh, you know double crossing people or committing acts of violence or just uh criminal activities in order to get that desired treasure if you will you know they they, they seek that forbidden fruit if you will and uh, Rumiko Takahashi reminds us that it's not always about that and instead you're focusing on things that you can't obtain whereas you should be focusing on uh, love and friends, family and just uh, living life to the fullest and as well as you can. Instead you have these characters that are kind of sick in the head chasing after an urban legend that might may or may not be true in the case of the book we do know it's true because we see the actual mermaids but still that's sort of not the point of the story right uh but nonetheless uh as i was mentioning earlier yuta he is seeking a way to end this curse and he finds the character of mana mana is a girl that was chained up in this abandoned house with these old ladies that happen to be mermaids as well they live in this forest secluded from the rest of the town some hijinks ensue i'm, I'm not going to spoil everything for this video i want you guys to read it and uh yuta eventually escapes that scenario with mana frees her and she's now traveling with him they could or could not be an item there's a chemistry that starts forming between each chapter as the two of them are seeking a way to end the curse if you will uh by trying to locate another mermaid uh for the curse to be lifted and all that stuff uh and along the way that's what you get in the chapters you get different uh people like i mentioned earlier as they're trying to acquire the flesh uh, obviously sometimes it works other times it doesn't uh we see that and we see that even if you do consume the flesh it doesn't mean you're going to be a happy person and you're probably going to be stuck with a lot of grief and a lot of anger resentment and tragedy as you move forward because it, it's only affecting yourself and not the people around you and sometimes it's at the cost of the loved ones that you're acquiring something that's supposed to be forbidden so the stories sort of revolve around that for the most part there are a couple of them that actually go back in time and we see Utah at a earlier point in time maybe like a few hundred years in still doing the same thing it's a very simplistic plot but it works for what it is it doesn't overstay its welcome at only 16 chapters you go in you get some nice uh spooky uh creature horror fun fest and you go on to the next chapter actually one of my favorite ones is chapter seven i believe where you have this Frankenstein's monster-esque uh, character. He's misunderstood. He tried to consume the flesh of a mermaid and didn't work out as he planned. And now he's turned into this monster type uh, fish variant. Um, and he's, you know, he's hiding away in a cave. Uh, at one point he kidnaps Mana and there are some fantastic callbacks to classic universal monster movies that i really appreciated that's one of my favorite things i love those movies and the creature horror if you will i'm not a fan of the supernatural stuff or the paranormal uh hijinks and the serial killers i prefer more like the aliens creatures werewolves type of thing or in this case uh mutated fish 
uh, giant dudes. I, I don't know. I like that sort of thing. It's creepy and it's physical. It's something, it's it's a monster that's coming at you and, and you can fight it or you can run away. It's not an unseen force. Uh, so, yeah, there are stories like that that, you know, you, you are, you take pity for characters like that that have been cursed. Other times it's more like uh, backlash between family members and how they stab uh, one another in the back by trying to acquire the thing and turning into immortals. Uh, a lot of family drama. It's, it's, it's interesting. It's a lot of mystery, noir-inspired tales with uh, horrific undertones. Uh, but I kind of preferred the, uh, you know, when the, the past tales and the one with the giant and stuff like that. That's just uh, my uh, preferred style, I guess. But the narrative itself is, even though it's the same plot looped chapter after chapter, uh, I would say the fault in it, for me at least, is that there is really no definitive ending to it. It just sort of ends, and that's it. <laughs> and I do understand, I, I get what the author was going for. You know, you have these characters that are essentially going on an endless quest to find a possible solution that may or may not happen, so the book sort of leaves that to your imagination if they're able to continue and uh, finish their journey. If not, it's just going to be this long winding road of meeting uh, people that are just um, unwell and are obsessed with the concept of immortality and reaching for that uh, forbidden fruit. But as for the art itself, I gotta say that's one of the best things about Mermaid Saga. The art is fantastic. I really do appreciate that uh, Viz Media took their time to craft this beautiful book, or these two beautiful volumes, I should say, and, you know, deluxe, signature-sized, uh, oversized compared to a regular uh, Bonga volume, and I do appreciate that it has a lot of colored pages and pinups that really do bring to life the wonderful art of Rumiko Takahashi. Even if it's black and white, seeing that stuff in color really does make you appreciate the story. And just the the 80s style in that. And, you know, with the hairstyles and the clothing and just the way everything's done. Of course, that famous Rumik art style that everybody loves. Whether you're watching anime or just reading the actual manga, you still appreciate that that is a Takahashi book, you know? But nonetheless, I really did enjoy Mermaid Saga. I wish it could have been longer. I wish the ending would have been a little meatier, a little bit different. But overall, the story's solid. You have fun with these two characters. And uh, just going over Japan, hunting for mermaids. What could uh, go wrong, right? But overall, just a really solid anthology series that I really enjoyed. How about yourselves? Did you read Mermaid Saga? Let me know in the comments section down below. And if you haven't, let me know what are some of your favorite monsters in anime or manga. Very interested in finding out. Guys, as always, thank you so much for liking, commenting, subscribing, and just being a part of A Week in Geekdom. Thank you so much. If you're new here, I do content like this, where I go over anime, comics, and manga, and of course, geeking out with all the polls and previews and first impressions, all that fun stuff. Thank you, everybody, for tuning in. God bless. Stay safe out there. I will catch all of you on our next video. Thank you.